We did uh, dark matter um, that interact with the nucleus. We are going on the opposite side of the spectrum that we will do dark matter, very light dark matter. Dark matter particles that are so light that the de Broglie wavelength is so large that you will st start seeing them as wave. So where I left last time, Where I left last, it's okay, sorry, no, it's fine. Where I left last time, we were there, we did WIMPs, so nuclear recoil. I didn't touch on the fact that we can use electron recoil in similar experiments or some kind of experiment with light nuclei to go lower in dark matter masses in B2, in the MEV region, almost in the KV region. I will uh, uh, leave this part here of the spectrum where there is a lot of R&D going on because they are, uh, the classical uh, method of nuclear recoil, electron recoil do not work anymore. So there is a lot of new technology based mainly on quantum um, information system and that are providing, I just gave you some idea like, uh, um, Tesseract and other experiments that are all based on phonon, have mainly uh, cryogenics experiment or uh, data based on phonon. Thank you very much. And then I'm going to do uh, the axion. And uh, uh, here, as I say, this is what I'm going to do. But before I move, I'm still staying in the nuclear recoil area. And I go back to the sodium iodide system. And why we have sodium iodide experiment, and most probably there are more sodium iodide experiment in the world or they are coming online, more than all the other technique. You can see we have sodium iodide experiment for dark matter in Europe, in uh, Korea, in Australia, even at the South Pole. The reason is, uh, I explained last time, that uh, there is an experiment that see a signal. This experiment look at the signal in a very different way than all the other experiment. With this experiment look at the change of the flux of dark matter on Earth as Earth goes around the sun and our sun goes around the, the, the galactic center and depending on the position of earth with respect to the galactic center and the sun you can see the velocity of earth can be in the same direction opposite direction or the direction of sun around the galaxy and so it means that the flux of dark matter reaching this galaxy that our earth change and modulate with time it's modulating with this velocity here is the modulation of the velocity and so you find that the cross section, and this is true for any, you know, in reality, this is what happened because dark matter, you can, we discussed dark matter, if it's called dark matter, it's non relativistic, so it doesn't move very much. It is uh, it just, um, uh, you can assume that it's almost still with respect to the velocity of Earth. Earth is going around the center of the galaxy with 800,000 kilometers per hour, so very fast but still not relativistic. So the cross-section of interaction of my particle with a nucleus is the cross-section we discussed that depends on particle physics and uh, astrophysics, plus a, a, a term that depends on this change in velocity because it's the change of the flux. And this is, is a cosine that you can see here modulate between December and June. And this modulation, the amplitude of this modulation, depending how you choose your model, can go between a few percent to up to no more than 30%. If you remember when we discussed about what is the rate of dark matter particle I expect per day, per kilogram, per keV, we are speaking at less than 0 0.5, 0 0.1, depending how you count. So you can imagine that what I'm trying to do when I'm trying to measure the modulation is no more than 30% of 0 0.1 count per day, per uh, event, per kV, per um, kilogram. So it's a very delicate experiment. It requires a lot of precision and uh, that's the difficulty. So there is an experiment with 250 kilograms of ultra pure sodium iodide crystal in Gran Sasso that for more than 20 years has observed this modulation. 
The issue with this experiment that if I do the classical vanilla WIMP, so classical uh, WIMP that is a scalar and so on, the most simple model, all the other experiments already excluded the mass range that this experiment would see, even itself exclude itself. So it means that if there is a modulation, if there is an observation, this signal, if it's true, this means that it's not a standard WIMP. Maybe we have a dark matter uh, particle or dark matter particles, a spectrum that is quite complex. So it's very important to test this experiment to see if it's true that all the other experiments see nothing. And this is some seasonal effect of some kind that happened in Gran Sasso. And I must say that uh, flux of muon and other particle coming from the sky, from cosmic ray, has been tested by other experiments in Gran Sasso, like Borexino, it is a neutrino experiment, and they didn't see the, the modulation that they observed on cosmic ray reaching Gran Sasso is shifted over a month with respect to the modulation observed by Dama. So this is, has been excluded, but it's important to test this experiment. It's the only signal we have it's controversial, but it's important to see. And that's why we had, we had so many sodium iodide experiments happening in the world and a lot of research and development for new sodium iodide experiments. So where the signal is seen, this is the recording spectrum of the DAMA experiment. And this is, uh, you see the modulation part. The signal is seen in a region between uh, uh, one to, uh, I would say 2 kV, 1 to 4 kV. In the first uh, uh, part, they didn't have the sensitivity to go in this region, so the, the, the signal they saw was here, but now that they have sensitivity to go down below 2, G, 2 kV, the signal is stronger also in this part, so this is there. So if you want to reproduce this experiment, and this is also will go what kind of experiment and how you work with this experiment and you build, the, the things you need to know now is to be able to reach and measure this region of interest very precisely for the part and also very consistently. This experiment, you are measuring a modulation all the year. Other experiments can stop and start. This experiment needs to be very constant, very well monitored all the year. So. And so this is when we look at the significance, 12 significance, 12. <clears throat> 12 sigma confidence level significant. The period, uh, especially when I go to one to three kV, that seems the signal is really spotted on on what I expect. And this is the amplitude, it's about 1%, 10%. So what I need to do to reproduce them and see if it's right or wrong, because there is a lot, well, I need to be able to be as, at least as sensitive as Dama. And the challenge here is to have very ultra pure sodium ionic crystal and being able to control the electronic noise of your photomultiplier really very well because really you are at the limit of their sensitivity. This is the DAMA data analysis. This is the signal. This is the region of interest. What they're looking, they're looking at, uh, they have this crystal as squared cross section. They are looking at interaction with the crystal that happen only once because if it's dark matter and all experiments do this, you will have only one interaction in the detector because it's very rare. If it's neutron or other particle, normally you expect more than one interaction in your detector. So they look if you have an interaction in one of the crystal and there must be no interaction around. And so they pick up only these events. This is the new data that they showed the last run they did. And this is in the one three kV region and one six kV region. And here they show the modulating and then more non-modulating part. And you can see that it's very strong. The signal is in 1.3. Here is integrated with the three and above where there is no modulation. And this is the modulation and non-modulation part. And they show that really they have a difference between what they expect as a background that is not modulating and the modulation part. Now, when we interpret our data, so our detector C counts, our detector C current that comes out. But in reality, what's happened here in the sodium iodide is, for example, my dark matter interacting with iodine 
but you can interact also with sodium. And then there is this electron coming out with the scintillation. And so I need a factor that relate my real nuclear recoil, what's really happened, because this is what entered in my cross section, and this is what entered in my signal, and this is what enters with a signal that I'm seeing that is electron that comes from my phototube. This conversion factor is what we call the quenching factor. That is just a conversion factor. And to do this quenching factor, there are two methods. Either you go and accelerate a nuclear accelerator and you take a neutron, a pulse neutron, and you change the energy of the neutron and see how your crystal res respond. Or you can use a, a source of various source uh, of neutron and do that. Obviously, you cannot do while your detector run or before you put your crystal during the detector. So if you want to do while your detector run or before you use your crystal for your experiment, you need to use a source. Otherwise, if you put your crystal in a neutron source, you uh, contaminate your crystal and you need to throw it away. So DAMA uh, use a quenching factor done with this source that is um, a monochromatic source. When they will stop uh, running in a couple of years, we are going. Back. They will measure uh, most probably with uh, with an accelerator because it was a technique that came after the start. You can see the accelerator part over here. The start in the year two thousand, and then uh, here you can see the quenching factor. This quenching factor, and you can see that here is more or less. Uh, equal apart some of them, the older one, but here they start uh, as the energy, the recoil energy start going lower, data disagree. And this is an issue and we don't know why. We don't know if there is uh, a dependence on the kind of crystal, how the crystal are growing. There is a lot of chemistry. There is a lot of way you can grow a crystal. Is the, the crystal is doped for tallium because you want that the emission of the crystal goes in the visible for your photomultiplier. We don't know, and there is a lot of study. But there are two other experiments they're trying to reproduce DAMA. One is cosine that uh, has 100 kilogram of sodium iodide crystal, and the other is anise with uh, similar mass. And both they produce a, a, a results. This is the DAMA results, cosine results, and anise results. You can see the error on DAMA is obviously very small. Cosine is in the middle, anise claim that they have exclusion, but this is something that we got. And then there is the question that this number here are multiplied by a quenching factor, and these are multiplied by the quenching factor that each experiment use, and each experiment has its own quenching factor. But what it means to multiply by the quenching factor? Well, this is the energy recoil of my signal. And you can see that depending if you use the gamma quenching factor or one of the other quenching factor, you are assuming that you are going in different region of what is your region of interest of the recoil. So if I look, for example, this number, all of them using different quenching factor, they are claiming that they're going in a different region of interest. So one of my students did this, the, the following exercise. What happened if I start changing my quenching factor to the central value of these things? And these points here are quenching factor. When you move all the experiment with a different quenching factor, this is the Stingler with sodium iodide quenching factor, is with iodine, and this is with, um, with sodium, because you can be interacting either with the sodium or with the iodine, you don't know. And you can see that the central value of this number comes. So an exclusion, a negative can go positive and all the results start getting much more closer together or different together. There is a lot of study now on all the sodium iodide crystal uh, detector to understand how to use the quenching factor, why different people measure different quenching factor. And uh, if, uh, you know, if I see a noise signal is part of the quenching factor clearly, uh, for DAMA, no matter how you change the quenching factor, the signal is there because there's a small error, but for ANA is uh, uh, still uh, not clear. So I will discuss now one of the experiments, the experiment I'm building, because I want to describe how you choose the parameter to do your experiment. This is a particular experiment. It's the first time is this is attempted. You have an experiment that is in two hemispheres, the northern hemisphere in Grand Sasso and the southern hemisphere in Australia, because you want to do this measurement and test DAMA, and you want to be sure that, you, that your modulation is not a seasonal effect. So you put an experiment in the southern and in the northern are correlated, and they are very similar, the experiments. So we have the same sodium iodide crystal. 
So how we design the experiment? First of all, we need to know where the signal is. Now we have a signal from Dama. So we need really to understand the kind of background we have here. We need to uh, understand also uh, the modulation of uh, cosmic rays, so like a very high energy cosmic ray um, that induce neutron in our detector. And this is radon, the environmental radon also we need to reduce. And this is something that all the underground experiments have an issue with. So how do we design the experiment? We know what, which kind is our uh, the region of interest and which background we need. So we go deep underground, we already discussed. We choose a very low radioactive material in here. There is a lot of R&D and now we'll show you what we achieve with the crystal. It's really, we are speaking about R&D that could be up to 10 years. We then shield, as I discussed last time, the experiment where you can have an active reject veto of the background and then you do what we call precision cleaning. So this picture here is not a science fiction movie in which there is a, a pandemic. This is when uh, the survey proof of principle was at Grand So we start cleaning the experiment. So we went in this clean tent. So this is taken from outside, completely dressed with asthma suit. We even had a mask because even your, breath, your breathing can disturb and we start cleaning. And once you clean, you put your experiment in an art nitrogen, in pure nitrogen, because you don't want to be contaminated. And this is LV when they needed to attach this part in the very sensitive region of the experiment. What happened? They keep the nitrogen flux, they dress with asthma suit, and they enter in the clean area around the experiment with oxygen bottle like uh, you know like you diving because they didn't want to put normal air because radon could come in deposit on your experiment and be really difficult to remove so it's really a, quite an adventure and uh, many experiments need to use oxygen bottle when the, we arrive to the final mounting so here is the requirement. So if we want to have our experiment, this is our region of interest. We need to design the experiment such that the main background comes from our crystal and all the rest of the material that shield our crystal cannot contribute more than 10 to 20% to the total background of the experiment. And uh, um, when we speak about cosmogenic, that is not in this plot. Cosmogenic means that every time I have anything on surface, cosmic ray may activate, may create tritium in your uh, uh, elements and the tritium start decaying. So is a part and unfortunately the tritium is coming in the region of interest. So with cosmogenics, that means how we transport our crystal once it's produced from the producer to the lab. We want that the crystal is 95%, 94% of the background. So all the rest must be only 10%. So every kind of material need to be screened to be sure that we achieve that. Now, when we are speaking about the background of the crystal, we want that our crystal is less than 0.4 uh, count per kilogram per kV. And so the total experiment is less than one count per day per kilogram per kV. That is a very, very high level of purity. And you can see here where the contamination is the total background. This is the rate, you see, that where we are. The main background is coming from the lead 210, and this is coming from radon. That's radon is evil. And uh, uh, rubidium we have here. And then here there is this peak that is the, the potassium 40. And you can see this is quite disturbing, the potassium 40, because there's a peak exactly where you see the signal. You also want high ion yield, and we want 10 photoelectron volt for kV. That also, this is quite interesting because if you look at the photomultiplier, normally the quantum efficiency of your photomultiplier is quite low. We're speaking about 10, 20 percent. We did R and D with Amamatsu to be sure that we have a thirty percent quantum efficiency. So, looking at the crystal, so here there is the number, in some case, part per billion or part per trillion of contamination. And you can see Dama here. Dama is very clean crystal. In particular, the only 13 part per billion of uh, uh, potassium 40, very low uranium, lead, 
and so on. And you can see all these other experiments that are trying to reproduce P colonies and RD is not a real experiment, but have very nice crystal. So you can see that anais and cosine, they have, especially in potassium, very, very large background, much larger than dama. And so it's not clear, and in fact, they admit that crystals are not clean enough to be able to reproduce dama signal if there is there. This is the SABA. We went to this very long R&D, and you can see that we managed to achieve potassium and thorium, potassium much lower than dama, thorium, also quite good. We're still having with lead to 10, but we are now employing a new technique that is, uh, this is, as I say, you enter in the chemistry department now, and uh, these, uh, we are doing zone refining, and we hope with the zone refining, you can see here, that we can remove the lead 210. The lead 210 comes from radon, and when you produce the powder, the sodium iodide powder, that then you grow the crystal, you have water. And if your water comes from underground, we'll have a contamination of radon. And for this level of contamination is important for us. So we are having now this oven for zone refining, and we hope that our crystal that will be produced sometimes this year, the first crystal, will be also the potassium reduced. And this is after we use the crystal, all the other experiment that do sodium iodide are hoping to use our crystal because as I say, it's very clean. Then we have our veto system. This is also something that quite large and the veto system is such that if you have a potassium 40 decay, it will emit an electron and a photon that will be seen in this veto that is a liquid scintillator instrumented with photon multiplier. And you can see what your potassium 14 contamination normally in even with our very pure crystal. And so you have a reduction of 10, a factor 10 of this. So really eliminating this peaking background that is really may disturb your signal. So we will have sensitivity in the experiment this is the experiment. This is our 50 kilos of sodium iodide, the liquid scintillator, the instrument with photomultiplier, 20, um, 200 tons of steel, high purity steel. And everything is, uh, the, the experiment is in this, this crystal, in this copper enclosure that will be put in the liquid scintillator. And before I go on, this is the comparison when you have very high cleaning, uh, material with respect to the crystal. So this is, we would start after all the other experiments. You can see the discovery potential of SABA is comparable, uh, the one, the same discovery potential for um, DAMA. And also here with the, with the exclusion, we will ramp up the exclusion ramp up slower, but you can see that going cleaning, cleaner, you have an advantage. At a certain point, this experiment will tail off and will not produce much more um, limit. The limit will not improve because they reach the sensitivity and they already are reaching the sensitivity of the crystal. While we will going up because we have a sensitivity that is higher than DAMA. The other things of the Southern hemisphere that uh, the muon flux season are reversed muon flux, high energy muon, depend on the density of uh, atmosphere, proton gap of the sun, they start showering. This is a calorie, you can think the atmosphere as a calorimeter, the number of muon that reach earth and their energy change with the season. So season are inverted in the plane. So if there is any seasonal effect, the Southern and the Northern hemisphere We'll see. So if you see a signal that has the same modulation in the northern and southern hemisphere, this is dark matter. If it's opposite, this is uh, a seasonal background. So in the next few years, we will know if DAMA is correct or not. If DAMA is correct, we discover dark matter. If DAMA is not correct, we need to know what is observing. And trying to reproduce DAMA has been a real challenge for everybody because it's a very precise experiment that require a lot. So now we, I went there, as I said, electron recoil I'm not touching and also absorption, I just gave you an idea, this will be there what's going on. So we go now on a particle, the axion in which the energy, the mass of the particle is so small that the De Broglie wavelength is so large, so I don't see particles, so I'm not looking for a scattering, I'm looking for a wave. And so we will see now the 
technique change completely. These experiments do not need to be underground because they're not disturbed by cosmic ray because they are antenna. They are really radio. And so they are looking in a different phase space. But before I go to the experiment, I want to just mention one thing. We assume that this is called, this is the simulation of a, a galaxy. This is the, the fuzzy things uh, is the dark matter in the galaxies, in various galaxies, in cluster of galaxies, and the pink part are the galaxies. So what happened? Well, we know the, the dark matter exists because otherwise galaxy wouldn't be holding together. It's the glue that keeps together galaxy, is the glue that pro produced structure, what you call structure formation. So the universe as we have it now and the cluster of galaxies. So you can reproduce the evolution of the universe using simulation, very large simulation from astrophysics. And when they use and assume that it's called dark matter, the whip that we discussed, they are able to reproduce with a good approximation, the universe and how galaxy collapse and so on. However, what's happening if my dark matter is not cold but warm, means that it's small enough that the velocity is not anymore a non-relativistic velocity, you start getting on the relativistic side, not, not ultra-relativistic uh, hot dark matter, because then there is no way that you can have structure formation, but much faster than with a velocity that is non, uh, this larger than what we have now. This is what you do in the simulation. You can see the structure gets fuzzy. And so it's, it's clear that depending on the velocity of that matter, you may ever not the structure of the universe today. So eventually when you go with action and the kind of, of dark matter we are doing now, we need to be careful because still here, they're on the astral side, they are not able to do structure formation if the dark matter is go too fast, it's too relativistic. And so there is a sweet spot where still it is possible. And there are also the sweet spots that you can assume the dark matter is a mix of cold and, and uh, hot and warm dark matter. It cannot be hot, as I say, no structure formation and see if the, if the things can be done. So this is need to be kept in mind. So now I enter in action. And my point is that at the moment there are no simulation, large scale simulation that give you the universe like that is quite nice. They can put an axion in and get structure formation. Doesn't mean that it's not a, a dark matter candidate. Doesn't mean that I cannot accommodate. Doesn't mean that maybe my dark matter is so complex that I can accommodate everything. So now we go to axion. We were suggested a long time ago to solve uh, the strong CP problem. I will explain what it is and uh, the way you do the detector is really a radio for dark matter. They really, you're using cavities and everything you use for the radio. How the axion come about? The axion come about because when you have the, um, the axion explain why the neutron doesn't have an EDM, a, a magnetic dipole. This is the, the, our neutron doesn't have a magnetic dipole. So why? Well, it should have a magnetic dipole for various reasons. It doesn't have. So how do we remove the fact that it has a magnetic, uh, um, that the EDM is zero? Well, we can put a new field in our equation for people that do quantum field theory in our Lagrangian in the part of the QCD that has a some angle, some phase. And this phase gets summed up with our um, physics and remove the EDM. And this phase is such that in the quantum chromodynamic, in the strong uh, force in QCD, we do not have uh, CP violation. Because electroweak has CP violation, but not the strong interaction, and there is no reason. So you can introduce this new field, and this new field is the action. You can have also the action dark matter, and it's the way that this axion that oscillate with an angle, and this angle is the angle of this CP. So you can think about here is the wave of your um, axion, and this is the frequency, and this is the frequency is that in the case of QCD, it's very well defined. And this is a um, kind of 
mechanism can be extended to dark matter. Dark matter is uh, beyond the, the Pechequi mechanism because in the Pechequi mechanism, there is a relation between the uh, coupling of an axion and the mass of the axion, but dark matter axion or axion like can be something much more general. But this is how it's introduced. People like the fact that you have axion because it's motivated by a real problem that's been introduced before dark matter was away, but keep in mind, it's giving a lot of problem for structure formation. So how do we uh, look at axion? What is our signal? As I say, is a wave, as uh, yesterday Marcus said, can be a wave as big as our galaxy, very long wave. This is can, uh, so our Earth is in, in enveloped in this um, axion. And the experimental signal will have an amplitude because it's a wave and will have a frequency. And the frequency is related to the mass of my axion. So how do I see the axion? The axion is a very particular uh, particle or axion-like because they, the axion, couple with photon. So axion couple with magnetic field, with B. And so you can have here, and the axion, when you speak about the axion, the mass of the axion versus the couple of the axion, and if you take into account, and this is, could be another big discussion, a cosmological and astrophysical information about uh, dwarf galaxy, the sun, and so on, this is more or less the, the sun, this, I would say, the space space that experimental direct detection on axion can, uh, you know, is important. And you can see the axion mass versus the axion coupling. And you can see here, this is the axion, uh, the, where they saw the strong CP uh, problem, as I said, mass and coupling are correlated. But here there is helioscope. This is related to measuring a, a particular kind of things that axion that comes from the sun. And here there is a laser. I will discuss one experiment is the shining uh, light through the wall. And this is what we have, the, uh, the haloscope that uh, are cavities that try to see these kind of experiment. This is an old um, uh, part. And you can see that uh, there are a scan in frequency mass that means in frequency of my, uh, of my antenna, of my radio to see. And so the idea is that to have um, experiment that can cover masses and here it depends on the frequency of your cavities and here is the axion coupling and it depends on exposure. So huge amount of experiment because many of them are tabletop experiment. The largest one I would say is RDMX is maybe the one that produced the strongest limit at the moment. There is a few around in Europe and uh, is not only looking for the axion, there is also in this part axion like dark photon and scalar vector. I'm not going to do scalar vector, but this is where we'll be looking at spin ensemble and other part. Going back to the axion coupling, how do we do our experiment? As I say, is um, coupling with an electromagnetic field. So I have my current. I don't know if you remember, this is the... If your Maxwell equation, this is the displacement, the, the current, uh, the divergence of B is a current, and then there is this extra field that is a field of oscillating, and this is where you put your axion, and this is how you do. So you put, you, you create a cavity, an, an area with an extreme, uh, with a, a B field, and um, the axion will induce a current in the E field, in, in the B field, so an E field, and that's how you measure. Holoscope. Holoscope are the one that has been used most of it, uh, that the bigger one, and there is a lot of R&D also in part. They were proposed by Skivy in the 83. RDMX is the first holoscope that has been done. What you have, you have a cavities that is cool a few Kelvin, and or even milli Kelvin, some of the new experiment with high um, with high frequency have a millikelvin, so in dilution fridge. And then you have a, a, a extremely uniform magnetic field. You have your axion and you have uh, now this real photon and part. And so you have, you start seeing an oscillation, this, this displaced current, the equivalent of displaced current in your cavities. And so you measure. Now, 
This is uh, the two larger telescope. RDMX is really the best experiment on axion we have as the very stronger limit you can see here is four meter long is in uh, Washington, the University of Washington in Washington in, um, in the Washington state. And, um, and that's here. You can see here the microwave cavities. Here are the fridge that cools everything, the squid amplifier and the magnet. There is another one, haystack, also very similar and quite large. And we operate high stack at millikelvin because they are trying to go higher in frequency. Now, one thing that I need to say about cavities, when you look at uh, um, the, uh, you measure, you try to see, uh, an axion, you measure a frequency. And normally you have that you are sensitive to particular a particular frequency or a set of frequency. So you're building all these experiments, but the number of frequency you can see is very limited. And you want to expand as much as you can the number of frequency you can do. So what you can do, well, you can do a few things. Here you can tune your cavities to see different frequency. And so it's like having everybody trying to test always a, a, a different frequency, a, a, try to call a phone number. You have all these women trying to answer call and see if there is anybody on the other side that has seen an action. And so you can see here that you have this tunable rod that you can move. So experiment like ADMX can have a large access to frequency than just one if you have a particular cavities. The difficult part that uh, for a while has been accessing high frequency. High frequency that means ADMX, you can see here, this very high frequency there. And so you need to find, and this is the organ experiment, for example, how you can access that. So there are these experiments and now also a DMX because the people in Oregon are now working also in a DMX that are looking how you look at high frequency. Well, you need a smaller cavities, obviously, we have a smaller Q factor and you have less sensitivity to your mass. So obviously here you have higher sensitivity. This is uh, um, the uh, axion, the co coupling versus the mass, and you can see here. So people un un created what they call the pizza cavities, in which you see the cavities is sliced like a pizza. And so you have uh, each part of the cavities with a, um, a different Q factor, a slight different Q factor, and then how you can increase your bandwidth. You know, it's like uh, you have a radio that is more tunable than just uh, a normal one. Uh, this group is a group in Western Australia. They are working uh, with very high frequency cavities and they are pushing higher and higher frequency. Um, and this is the organ experiment. And this part here is still the, out, the internal part of a dilution fridge. Organ is at few millikelvin. This kind of experiment on IQ, they go on millikelvin. So taking into account everything that exists, there are a huge amount of experiment coming online and a lot of information. This is the mass versus the coupling. That's where we are now. And you can see here, this is mainly coming from astrophysics. This is cast at CERN. Here again, X-ray, this is again, astro particle and astro information. And here where most of the holoscope comes on, and you can see flash at DMX, Mad Max, organ, and so on. And they are all here start putting their limit, but you can see they're still very far or RDMX start going in the line where Axion, this is more or less the line, this is the, is becoming, this is the line, sorry, where the Axion that is, can be, can solve the CP problem, the strong CP problem line. So there is a lot of activity and uh, it's quite interesting what's happening here. Some of them, they're just in a few, um, in test run and so on. So you can have a different, we, we saw uh, um, IDMX and company, different cavities, but you can also have a different telescope, which your antenna is not anymore a cavities, but is really a dish, you know, like you have a, a satellite dish. And so you have a spherical dish and a detector at the center, and so it works again, a broadband approach because you want to be sensitive to a broadband. So you have a better antenna. And this one is studying is this kind of alloscope is in Germany in particular. This is called Mad Max. The experiment is quite large. The action experiment is becoming quite large. 
you can see here you have uh, the antenna receiver with your parabolic uh, uh, mirror and here you have your mirror again and you have a very strong magnetic field so you want to see your axion interacting and so this is our parabolic antenna for the axion then we have the magmax magnet this is the challenge because uh, this is, has been a, a quite complex magnet you want a uniform magnetic field this particular shape you wanted uh, nine Tesla with 1.2 meters of aperture, and this has been most of the R and D of the of this kind of magnet. So for this parabolic part, the, your problem is not to have a very good uh, um, cavities or working with the Q factor is uh, is really magnets because then you have your parabola. The limit that you expect for the magma projection. You can see they're going very, very low, and they start reaching uh, the, uh, the part that you really would like to see, that is the QCD action. And then uh, this is the projection in the future for RDMX, uh, but RDMX, I must say, they're also extending over here in this area with uh, the te technique like the pizza cavities that is um, similar, that are developed by a group like the one uh, of Oregon. Then I have my last uh, experiment. This is, um, this is a quite an interesting experiment, I would say. This experiment is a uh, uh, shining light through the wall. In this experiment, you have that your axion interact with your magnetic field or, and it's passing and then it's going the other light. So you have that, you have an interaction with the axion, you have a wall. And so you have two cavities, one in front of the other. One is, is a production cavities and the other is the regeneration cavities. So you have the interaction with your axion. You pump your cavity with a laser here, producing the interaction with the axion. The axion goes through the wall because it doesn't interact with anything that is not electric field, magnetic field. Then uh, this is the other cavities where your axion will uh, interact with your magnetic field. And here you have a detector and this detector will see light. So in practice, what is your experiment is you have a laser here, you shine the laser here, there is a wall. If there is an interaction with the axion, the axion go on the other side. And so you will be seeing light from this side to this side, that is called light shining through the wall. This is, we'll see not only axion, this is any kind of axion-like particle, anything that interact with an electric field. This is a very cool experiment. Still didn't, nobody saw anything, but will be cool if you can shine. This is also an experiment that is getting uh, quite large. All these experiments are went from tabletop experiments. So if you see experiment like, uh, um, for example, um, organ is just one dilution fridge so it's something like that you have a copper tube nitrogen flux it, and like that but this is uh, becoming you can see much much larger and you can see here the cavities where you will this is the driving laser and this is here the part where you will have the experiment so you can see here the experiment ops too uh, i think is in daisy so you will have here the laser that will pump the production cavities and you can see here the wall and then the recreation cavities and you can see here the crystal and here I can see where the, um, the laser is over here and all the control of the experiment and here they are mounting and you can see how big is this experiment so the, we are getting quite large. So now where we are so uh, I, you see that very big excursion i touch only the two different extreme nuclear recoil on one side and the other is that all this part and you can see the technology changed quite a bit there is in the middle the electron recoil that can be done of most of the standard wimp experiment even though we are going more and more on bolometer to do low uh, mass and then there is an area that is really like under the mev level for dark matter that is full exploring. There are experiments that are coming and uh, trying to solve the MEV level, but then between the, uh, the axion 
and the MEV, there is a large area where we really have no idea how to do. There are a lot of idea, but most probably there is not anymore in the, re in the, uh, in the region of particle physics or even a quantum system. They are most probably we go to atomic physics where with some of the um, effect really, if, you know, people are thinking of uh, having interaction with uh, crystal lattice or other kind of part. And there is a lot of work going on, still very theoretical and still a lot of idea, but not really. So that is really the gap. So I didn't explain, gave you all the experiment that exist in nature. Because as you can see, it's a huge field. Um, because different from other fields, even if we have the large uh, the, the, the collider field, we have uh, each nation has its own experiment, large or big, or even international. And is a and I would say at the moment we are, I forgot, in a situation that there is a lot of activity going on. This is not to do with dark matter. This is our solar axion. And this is cast is the largest one. And there is Shao that is also coming. Big magnet. Caster was the LHC magnet has been picked out of the machine. And it has very strong limit, but very high with respect to the other experiment, the cavity experiment. But they're also looking at the different physics. So where we are now on uh, part, well, we start our trip. I like this part on the in an uh, unknown part of the universe that is started now. And we are looking for this unknown part uh, with very little guidance, you know, like, uh, and um, at the moment I show the experiment that uh, we assuming that particle, dark matter particle is one kind of particle, can be a fermion, can be a boson, but it even could be that it's a very complex situation much more complex than what we can think. And that's why we can reconciliate different experiments, see different things. There is no theory that can explain dark matter, not even modify gravity. So the challenge that we are having in this field is that uh, we have uh, everything. We have the improbable, the possible, they may be the no. And I think in the next few years, maybe 10 to 20 years, we will explore everything. We start with the possible, then they may be, then the improbable. And until we find so most probably at a certain point, we will understand or will uh, or we'll think that uh, the most bleak, I would say, of all our expectation is that dark matter is, uh, uh, well, coupled only gravitationally. There is no change in gravity and we are stuck. and. Uh, we will look forever, or we may have a discovery in the next five to 20 years. I think I finished there and leave time for questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Ma'am, I did not understand the part where you said that uh, uh, since we have experimented different latitudes we are going to remove the seasonal effects but even if seasonal effects are being removed how can we resolve this uh, effect because the speed of uh, our galaxy uh, our solar system in the galaxy is same for both the latitudes right yes yes so there are um oh, forgot to share sorry uh there are this is about the modulation yes so when you look for the modulation, your signal, you're right. You know, the modulation must be the, sa the same in the northern and southern hemisphere. However, for example, you have cosmic ray. And cosmic ray are due to proton or other particle, mainly proton, accelerated by uh, the magnetic, the electric field in the galaxy in our solar system. They reach Earth, interact with our atmosphere, and they start showering. And they produce this very energetic um, New one. Now, the density of the atmosphere change with season. So for example, here you can see uh, the density that the, the, um, the, the density of the atmosphere changes. So you have like how many uh, cosmic ray, how many muon that are very energetic and can reach your laboratory are produced and also the, the flux of them changes. 
obviously the northern and the southern hemisphere are opposite so if you have a seasonal effect like the muon that change with season and this is mimicking your dark matter you will understand that the northern and southern hemisphere will see a modulation you see a phase that is opposite or almost opposite and that's why you distinguish but it could be other effect for example the radon change with the temperature so again summer and winter but even if we get the same phase then then also it will not be resolved right because the speed uh, means if it is uh, other way around then obviously we'll uh, remove the effects but if it is in the same phase then uh, we cannot say it's a dark matter or not I think if it's the same phase it will be difficult to have a background that is non-seasonal. So the point is that the idea here, and I go back to the modulation here, is that the flux that you measure here depends on the velocity of Earth around the center of the galaxy. So this is really the kinetic, the kinematics of your solar system. So you need to find something that has the same period of dark matter the same uh, and northern and southern hemisphere see a signal that is the same the same part there is no background because the only thing we can think is seasonal that is you know must be correlated and i don't see anything that is correlated that is not dark matter i know that is controversial and i know that other experiments are um dismissing i'm not saying is right is wrong i say the only way you nail dark matter if you in the southern and northern hemisphere you see the same modulation thank you uh like uh more than a question is like a comment uh like uh the interaction uh, this uh so solar modulation depends upon the direction of the uh, dark matter wind okay so uh, if uh, rather than uh, seeing for the uh, solar modulation, if we look for the like sidereal modulation, then we can uh, suppress the uh, uh, seasonal effect as well as uh, the, uh, the other effect like uh, temperature variation effects. Uh, so we can, uh, so, but uh, uh, it may be depend upon the uh, like uh, velocity difference between them. No. Okay. So the velocity of Earth with respect to the center of a galaxy is known. The velocity, when you do your calculation, your cross section here, you use a Maxwellian kind of curve because obviously dark matter is cold, but doesn't mean that it doesn't move. So that you have a spread of velocity on dark matter. And then uh, it's just where you are in the part. So you can think about the following. Dark matter is like a sea water that envelop our galaxy really large. And we're going through the water and we see this flux. So in reality, our flux is determined only by the velocity of Earth with respect to the center of the galaxy. Okay. Hi, um, so on about slide 85 or so, I think it was the Axion laser methods where you put a laser through a wall and interact with the magnetic yes, field. Yes, last one. Considering you're working with such an inter uninteractive particle and running on two separate interactions, are there estimates or what are the estimates for the axon event rate across its parameter space for such I a slow mole? So you want to know the, the, the rate, how much? The, the estimated rate, rate across the parameter space, I'm assuming it. It, must depends, be on the, it depends again on the mass of the axon versus the cross sec yeah. the part is there and uh, at the moment is there. So thank you. They are, the coupling is very small. Thank you. Okay, I think that we will end the session, but before ending this complete session, I have some responsibility. Okay, just one more thing <laughs> I should tell this. Uh, you people are here, just uh, repeating from the students. Uh, you people outside is warm, but this is the day to have this school. The only reason is that in 1993, this 12th February, the third IPA school were held here. Oh. So I just tried to match exact date of 30 years. <laughs> so that's the, this is one the school why it is 12 in the little Walmart. And second thing is the students know that I'm just telling you that our founder directors, uh, he was very fond of art and he was also an artist. And that's the one of the picture you may see that is this uh, once in this one of the meeting 
He oh. just took the Niels Bohr. In the meeting, just to the discussion table, he just draw these pictures. And he was, he was himself the artist. So he so contact is in the institute has a good collection of the art. And this is this one of this document where we collect all these arts. Oh, nice. And that's Thanks. on the mirror of this thing. Thank you. Thank you. And other small thing is uh, from the local tribal of the people. Another piece of art that's uh, nice. Yes. <laughs> now we will have a five minute break and then we'll have an estimate. <laughs>